We're going to move on to um, our last but definitely not least presentation, which is going to be from Max Brown. As you folks all know, Max Brown is now at the IRM, Institute for Rock Magnetism in Minnesota. And he's going to talk about uh, some work that he did from his time in Iceland, I believe, um, paleomagnetism of circa zero to five million year lava flows from Western Iceland, new results from Borgafjordur. And I'm sure I pronounced that wrong, but let somebody else correct me. I, I can't pronounce it, Kathy. So uh, don't worry oh. about that. Um, so thank you for the introduction, Kathy. Um, so this uh, work I'm presenting today is really a highly collaborative project. And I'm really just the front person for all this work as it's been going on um, since the uh, early 90s when uh, Masaru Kono and co-workers um, went to Japan and started this project. Um, and th yeah, there's many uh, people, uh, funding agencies and people that I would like to acknowledge uh, the University of Iceland was very generous in their funding of this work, included funding of the laboratory in Iceland and the Japanese Society for the Promotion of Science has given um, various grants over the years to continue this work. I'd also like to uh, thank Leo Christiansen, uh, who sadly passed away this year, but his help uh, during my time in Iceland was invaluable um, and his huge body of work um, is quite remarkable for Iceland. And I'll be touching on this uh, a bit later in the talk. I'd also like to think, thank many students who have helped with this project um, over the past uh, few years, uh, and also other collaborators in Iceland who have assisted me uh, with the geology, especially, especially Christian Simonson. Uh, so the aim of this study is to obtain new information about directional changes in Earth's magnetic field over millions of years timescales. And we're going to combine radioisotopic dating with paleomagnetism to constrain the ages of the lavas. <clears throat> and we want to know what this might tell us about the long-term evolution of Earth's magnetic field. And we're going to take a brief look at the distribution of VGPs we obtained from these lavas and their scatter. So I'm just going to start with a little bit of background about Iceland. Um, so this is uh, a, a map of the ages of the rocks in Iceland. Um, I'm hoping you can see my mouse here. In, in the darkest green here and in the pink, we have the, the active regions of Iceland at, at the moment. And as we move uh, both to the northwest uh, and to the east, the rocks get older. So in the orange here, we have the oldest rocks of Iceland going back possibly to 16 million years. Um, ago. And in the blue um, triangles here, we have all the paleomagnetic sites that have been measured in Iceland so far. And we're going to be looking at this region around here in Iceland. So this project, which we call the Lunderhals project, was initially conceived in the early 1990s by Masaru Kono, um, who came to Iceland with his colleagues um, to sample numerous places around Iceland, but Lunderhaus being one of these. Um, and he came with uh, Hidofumi Tanaka, who did, who's a well-known paleomagnetist, and uh, Takahiro Koyaguchi, who's a volcanologist. Um, and he made a lot of work on the geological logs. Um, the results from this in initial work were never published, um, except for some data in the master's thesis of Kitagawa from 1998 and what we call the Blue Book, which is a report of their, their time in Iceland, which they submitted um, to JSPS at the time. Um, and here's just a couple of old images showing some of the original sampling team, um, showing uh, Tanaka Kono, Koyaguchi, some field assistants, and, uh, and, and there's Leo um, in the right-hand side image there. Um, but we had a new sampling team and we sampled in 2016, 2018, and 2019. Um, and my main collaborator on the project was uh, is Yuji Yamamoto from Kochi University, um, uh, his master's student, plus we had some undergraduate students helping, plus my master's student at the time, just Justin Tonti Filippini. But let's uh, just zoom out again and look at Iceland as a whole. Uh, down here in the southwest corner, we have Reykjavik, and the area we're looking at is about two and a half hours drive north. Um, 
and this is the Borgerfjordo region. If we zoom in a bit more, we can see some quite nice features of Iceland in here. So in the bottom right hand corner, you can see there's this uh, lineation that's occurring here. And this is the edge of the, the rift zone here. Um, we have some central volcanoes, young central volcanoes here, a Bronze Age and, and more recently, uh, we have a older central volca volcano over here. Um, but the area we're going to look at is in this box here, along the Lunda Rekidalur, uh, primar primarily Lunda House, but also um, England's House here. Um, and you can, you can see that we have quite high topography across here, um, a few hundred meters, and we have these uh, glacially and fluvially incised valleys as well, giving us very good, good exposures. So if we look in a little bit more detail um, about the sections that we measured, we can see that we have these different sampling campaigns. The 1994 sampling can, campaigns are in yellow here. We have VM, VS, VT, and then VA through VF. They also measured, uh, sampled VG, which we resampled in 2016, along with some of VH, which we resampled again in 2018, along with V, J, V, K, G, A, G, B. And more recently in 2019, we sampled E, A and E, B. But I'm not gonna talk about these sections in any detail because I have a current master's student working on the rocks from this section. So this is 17 sections overall, covering 21 kilometers. Um, and as I said, I'm gonna talk about 15 sections. Uh, results in 337 lavas, and we'll discuss 254 today, about 1,600 cords taken. Uh, in the early 90s, there was potassium argon dating made on the oldest rocks of the ridge. Um, and more recently, we've done argon argon dating with Brian Jika at the University of Madison, Wisconsin. Um, we show some results of that today, but we have eight more flows being uh, dated currently. So I just want to show some pictures of the area. Um, so this is um, the old, these are the oldest rocks of the ridge. This is Um It's uh, the photo was taken here, looking back on this edge of the ridge. And you can see this is a, a very large packet of lavas, um, between 35 and 40 lavas here. If we look in a bit more detail, we can see that we have very well exposed lavas. We can go up these nice gullies we have running water, everything's very nicely well exposed. Um, it's a really great place to come and do paleomagnetism. And it's very important to look at the geological considerations uh, when doing a study like this. Um, all the lavas in this area, they all tilt towards the, cent uh, towards the rift, uh, owing to the loading of the rift. So they all have um, a gentlish tilt towards the southeast. We also need to identify the variety of rock, volcanic rock types, understand their flow characteristics, the sediment layers. Um, we see numerous red beds. These can be soils or clastics or hydrothermally altered ashes. Uh, given the age of the rocks, we're going into glacial time. So we have glacial deposits, which can complicate the area. We also have dikes that we need to be aware of as well. And in this area, we have uh, numerous faults, um, at least 27. So there's a number of geological considerations uh, for this area. Uh, luckily, we there was some, already some geological mapping that had been done by Olmar Bjarkis Martinsen and Sigmund der Einersen and Ausgren McWilliamson. Um, and this was work they did as part of their undergraduate degrees um, in the mid 70s, supervised by Christian Simonsen. So we have an idea of the geology in this area. And in this figure here, I show the different rock types that we have, um, and I show the different faults and also the sections that were sampled. So you, you can see, for example, in these olivine basalts, these offsets resulting from the faulting. So these were all things that needed to be considered. So I'm gonna start talking about the paleomagnetic results now. Um, and you can see from this image that on the whole, we have very good quality data. Um, all the data you see here, these were measured at the Kochi Core Center in Japan. Um, the first image here, number A, this is from a normal flow just prior to the reversal, and you can see we have very linear behavior, basically no overprint whatsoever. 
and this is true for many of the larvas uh, of these sections. Um, we can also resolve transitional directions, and this is uh, a transitional direction from a reversal. Again, we can, it's a bit noisier, but we can resolve a primary component pretty well. Uh, here's another transitional flow. I'm not sure if it's from a reversal or maybe part of an excursion or extreme secular variation, but again, we can resolve this direction very well. Um, and in total so far, we've obtained 1,577 characteristic remnant directions from 254 lava flows. And if we look at um, the lava flow results on their whole, on a, as a whole, we can look at alpha 95 and, and kappa. Um, on the left plot here, I'm just showing the flows that have an alpha 95 less than 25 degrees. And this is 238 out of the 254 flows. And the medium alpha 95 is around about five degrees. Um, but we, for our cutoff, we use kappa. Um, we accept flows of the kappa greater than 50, and this leaves us with 250 flows for the creation of our composite profile. So that's 215 out of the 254. So not all lavas um, gave acceptable results, and that's also worth bearing in mind. So on this screen, I'm showing each of the individual sections. VM is the oldest of, of all the sections, and VK the youngest, and we move from old oldest to youngest here and again this way here. Um, and one thing you can see, for example, from VM to VS is that we have clear boundaries. These are either hiatuses with a break in polarity or reversal boundary. And there's some overlap, for example, here with VM and VS. Um, I also note that all of these VGPs here um, are adjusted for the lava strike and dip. Um, and we'll be using that data for the future analysis. So we need to put these sections together. And this isn't necessarily a straightforward task. Um, we combine our geological logs. And uh, Hiroyuki Hoshi made very detailed logs and uh, Koyaguchi previously. Um, we also compare the paleomagnetics uh, directions in this analysis. Um, and from our 215 sites, 10 of these sites are considered to be from the same lava flows. And this gives us 203 unique directions. However, in some cases, we couldn't correlate the sections. Perhaps there's missing strata um, that we don't know about. Um, and some sections were rather ambiguous to correlate. And we plan to revisit some of these uh, in the future, get some more samples for dating, perhaps doing a bit more PMAG, searching for some other lavas that, we can, that can help us clarify uh, clarify this. Um, and as I mentioned before, we have uh, potassium argon ages, and these were done in the early 1990s at Okayama University and Tokyo University. And these were part of the master's thesis of Kitagawa, and they obtained results from 18 flows. And these are mostly from the older flows, from, the, from Varma Laikamuli. However, alteration was a serious issue um, in these rocks. And in the master's thesis of Kitagawa, he noticed, he notes uh, there's discolored ground mass and altered glass filling among the crystals and colored secondary minerals in the ground mass. And if we calculate the uncertainties at two sigma, we're looking at uncertainties ranging from 100 to 500,000 years. Um, so these are very large. Um, after I removed uh, what they class as being altered results, there's around about nine flows that are dated. And these are the ones that are not crossed out here on the right side hand side of the figure. We've also had more recent dating done in the last couple of years at the University of Wisconsin Madison and Brian Jika did these measurements for us. And from these specific rocks, we have four lavas that have been dated. Um, all the samples contained, unfortunately, low radiogenic argon and showed some discordance. However, we could uh, obtain age plateaus from each of the samples. However, we're going to use the isochron ages as, the, uh, as these are more conservative. And we show, showed, uh, we see a disparity with the plateau ages and the GPTS ages. We also note that the uncertainties are still large. Um, and it's worth noting here that these argon-argon ages um, can't be used precisely to, di 
um, to date the field variations where, however, we use them as a guide to correlate to the GPTS. Um, so we obtained ages ranging from about uh, 3 million years um, up to about 3.6 million years from these rocks. Um, and so we dated some transitional samples here as well. Um, and this, these rocks here, these record the Gilbert Gauss boundary. Okay, so we now have our composite on the left hand side here, and we have our ages. So the oldest rocks here are around about 2.3 million years, um, going up to around about 3 million years at the top of our section here. So now we want to try and correlate these to the GPTS. So we first make um, a rough magnetostratigraphy. And we, we can see that we obviously have um, three major, uh, four major reversals in our section, but we also have some transitional directions here, possibly excursions, possibly some post reversal behavior. Um, I'm going to come back to this. It's a little bit complicated up here. So now we can uh, put up the GPTS of OG in 2012. And we can see that our isochron ages here agree quite well with the Gilbert Gauss boundary here. So we, we believe this is the Gilbert Gauss boundary here. Um, and if we go to the bottom of our section, this normal subchron here, this uh, correlates well with the Cochiti. Then we have a huge packet of lavas here. And um, this relates to the upper Gilbert, the C2AR. Then we have the Gilbert Gauss, and then we have another packet of lavas here at the lower Gauss, which is the C2AN.3N. But then things get a bit complicated here. Initially, we thought this must um, all be part of the C2AN3N, and this upper period m must be the mammoth. However, our argon argon ages suggest otherwise. They suggest that we're missing some of the stratigraphy, uh, in particular the mammoth subchron. However, it might be that we're sampling part of the mammoth subchron going out, uh, a transitional direction going out of the mammoth subchron here. And in our geological work, we notice that there is a large, a large hiatus, or should I say that there's a, a thick red bed at this time, and perhaps we have a hiatus here. And you must remember that we're going into glacial times here, and there is some interaction between the volcanism and the glacial activity, and we may be missing um, a period of the stratigraphy in our sections here. So we believe, based upon these ages, that the uh, reverse lavas here at the top are actually the Kayana, and we're missing the mammoth in our section. But we're going to revisit this, hopefully, in future fieldwork to really clarify what's going on here. Um, okay, um, this is just a summary. On the left-hand side, you can see um, the stratigraphy again, and I put the, the names of the different crons and subcrons on here. So our sections span approximately 4.3 million years to 3 million years ago. Um, we've sampled the Cochiti and Kayana subcrons, we believe. We've also sampled the Gilbert Gauss boundary, and we have this uh, dated. And we've, we have a huge, a very detailed record of the upper Gilbert here through the C2AR. And as I mentioned earlier in the talk, we've been doing uh, more work since this. Uh, we sampled two other sections with 83 lava flows, which we called EA and EB on the England's House Ridge. And from our initial work, we know that these are predominantly normal flows with reverse directions at the top. And we do have a data for these sections. And it would suggest that the reversal at the top of these sections is the gauss matiyama boundary. So we believe we, we in total, are spanning about 4.3 million to 2.5-ish million years ago in these rocks. OK, so what can we do with this data for understanding Earth's magnetic field over the past 5 million years? So we can just simply pop all the VGPs and, and see how they're distributed. And these are polar plots looking down on the North Pole. Um, and we can look at the data all of the data and calculate um, the, the Fisher mean VGP. And we can see that if we consider all of the data, we our pole it lies at 86.1 degrees latitude. If we exclude uh, VGP data that are less than 45 degrees, 
we move a little bit closer to the pole and that's the case with the reverse directions as well and if we include all of the directions but flip the reverse directions we can see that our pole is very close um, to the geographic north pole so it seems to conform to a GAD field here. Uh, we might also want to look at the distribution we could perhaps see if these directions conform to a Fisher distribution and these are uh, what we might expect if we had a Fisher distribution um, and we treated the, all the directions as normal and you, you can use the statistical uh, analysis uh, in at Lisa Cox's program the fish QQ um, and from the critical values we can see that they're not exceeded so uh, the hypothesis of a Fisher distribution cannot be rejected but of course there may, may be other distri distributions that could be plausible as well and we could go ahead and try and test those also. Um, and, but so far we just looked at the Lunderhaus data but there's many thousands of larvas that have been measured by Leo, Chris Jansen and others um, over the past 40 odd years or so. Um, and a couple of years ago, uh, my master's student at the time, uh, Justin Tonti Filippini, he made a GeoMagia style database for all of the results um, that, Le that Leo um, collected and others collected as well. So this gives us a huge data set to start looking in a bit more detail, comparing Lunderhaus with the Icelandic data set as a whole, and maybe making some statements about how the field behaves in Iceland over the past five million years. Um, but we wanted to apply some selection criteria um, and this is, I guess, a rather weak selection criteria given some criteria that have been used. We only accept data where the number of samples per flow is, per flow is greater than or equal to four, where kappa is greater or equal to 50. We did allow blanket AF demagnetization, but we didn't include NRM data. And this leaves us with 33 studies and 3,000 1,389 data. So we have a large data set to work with for this analysis. So this is the 0 to 5 million year field, but excluding the Lunderhaus data. Um, the data over this time is a lot more variable than for Lunderhaus itself. We can see in this plot, the, nor the normal field polar plot that we have many transitional directions over here. And this obviously pulls away our Fisher mean VGP from the geographic North Pole. But these, these data are really from one excursion, the R3N3 geomagnetic field reversal. But, and if we exclude such data, then our pole comes very close to the geographic North Pole. And we see that for the reverse data set. And again, if we flip the reverse and plot them all um, towards the North Pole here, we have um, a VGP latitude of 87.2, uh, very close to the geographic North Pole. And if we do the Fisher distribution um, analysis again, uh, these also, we can't reject that hypothesis. Okay, so we could also look at directional variability. Um, and it may be that the field may vary in direction at different times in Earth history. Um, and this may be related to changes in the dynamo, is likely related to changes in the geodynamo. Uh, Leo noted that for Icelandic larvas, directional variability appears to increase with age. We can't really test that with this set of data, but it's an interesting observation to note. Um, but maybe there are other patterns of variations that we can discern. Um, and, it's, and it's worth noting, as Richard did in his talk, that there's been significant efforts to compile uh, lava data globally and, and assess directional variability. Most recently, the PSV10 data set of Cromwell et al. in 2018. So I'm going to take this data set, but for the last 5 million years, um, and reverse polarity data was treated as normal polarity data and tran all transitional directions were excluded using the Van Damme cutoff. Whether that's the correct approach is open to debate. Um, and I'm gonna overlay on this um, model G as uh, Richard mentioned in his talk. And we're gonna just highlight the bin of interest here for us. And there was 110 data accepted in the PSV10 analysis 
and these data from, are from Alaska and Iceland, and they have a VGP dispersion of around 19 degrees. So I thought it would be interesting to see what we get from our data set from Lunderhaus. So if we look at our Lunderhaus data, where we have these 203 lavas, we see that the VGP dispersion is much greater. So this was uh, quite an interesting observation, but I wanted to look into it a bit further and see why this might be much higher than the Alaska Iceland it's been here. So if one idea perhaps is that normal and reverse directions have different variability. And if we look at the Lunderhaus normal data, it lies uh, much closer to the Iceland Alaska bin and quite close to the Model G prediction based upon this data. But if we look at the reverse data, it has a much higher VGP dispersion. So this is initially quite an interesting observation. But of course, we have all the, the other data from Iceland to look at as well. So it's interesting to compare. Yeah, just a couple of minutes now. Okay, no problem. Thank you, Kathy. Um, we can look at the ice beam magnetic data. And we really don't see any difference between the reversed and normal data. So the, the difference really in the Lunderhaus data really stems from um, the specific times that we're looking at. So in the lower Gauss um, normal period, we see that there's much lower VGP dispersion. And in the upper Gilbert, it's much higher. So this dispersion is really related to these specific crons and may suggest that the dispersion in different cons throughout time can be quite different, which really highlights the need to sample very long periods of time to be able to get an accurate measure of VD VGP dispersion for any site. I mean, we're looking at 1.5 million years here and we see this, these discrepancies in VGP dispersion. Yeah, okay. If we, can, if we add all of the ice PMAG and Linderhaus data together, we have uh, very low uncertainties on this and we have 1,366 data. We can again combine it with the Alaska data and we see that the Model G um, calculation var varies very little from that previously. Okay, so I'm just going to summarize. So we obtained welcome constrained CHRM directions and obtained from most of our lavas. The current composite magnetostratigraphy contains 203 flows from 15 sections, but we have two more flows, uh, two more sections to add with around 83 more flows. Um, we have new argon-argon dating and pilot potassium argon ages, uh, which suggests that we record the, the field from about 4.3 million years ago to about 3 million years ago. Um, we have very detailed directional changes through the upper Gilbert and lower Gauss crumbs, but we need to further dating to resolve some ambiguities in our magnetostratigraphy um, to really make sure that we have a robust section. Um, normal and reverse directions from the Linderhaus section tend to a geocentric axial dipole field, um, and this agrees with the 0 to 5 million year fission mean direction calculated from other Icelandic sites matching a selection criteria that we used. Uh, Linderhaus data are consistent with a Fisher distribution um, but the 0 to 5 million year data are only consistent with a Fisher distribution when the transitional data are removed. Um, the combination of published Icelandic data and our new Linderhaus data allows for a precise estimate of VGP dispersion at high latitudes and VGP dispersion may vary from cron to cron. Um, and if this isn't taken into consideration, could bias um, estimates of VGP dispersion. So I just wanna talk briefly about our future work, which is to complete the analysis of the younger sections that go up to the gauss matiama boundary, as well as trying to sample more sections. Um, and this is the work that my master student, Vivian Sinian, is working on currently. And hopefully we're going to go this summer and extend our stratigraphy even further. We also need to, need to tidy, up, tidy up some ambiguities in the stratigraphy, um, revisit some of the sections uh, to make sure we can get this as best as possible. And we also want to look at other areas in Iceland. We recently received a five-year grant from JSPS to conduct paleomagnetic research in the Westfield, so some of the oldest rocks in Iceland spanning between 13 and 16 million years. So it's going to be very interesting to see 
if we see different patterns in the geomagnetic field at that time. Okay, uh, uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Max, for that uh, really comprehensive summary of a huge project. Um, I see there are a bunch of questions in the chat. And uh, Lisa, you want to start since you were first in there? Yeah, I was just curious. Um, we've been goofing around with something similar down in, um, and this picture's from Iceland. <laughs> oh, um, yeah. <laughs> uh, the, um, We've been goofing around again with the Antarctic stuff. Hannah Asif just published a paper summarizing our, the most recent efforts on that. And her, along with um, Ron Shar in the Golan Heights, his student, uh, we discovered that a lot of these conclusions rely, it, uh, are dependent on your selection criteria. And we found that things got a lot simpler if you use stricter criteria. Of course, you rapidly end up with no data, but you have so many beautiful data from all this effort that's been going on. What happens to your, your um, feelings about what the field did if you use the criteria that Ron Shar proposed um, of n of six or more and a kappa of 100? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, all of Leo's data would disappear. That's... I know all of Leo's data. That's why he was so mad at me when I said, yeah. geez, you should use more. But... <laughs> yeah. um, but with our data, we, we tried to collect seven or more samples. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, if I can go back up, but I think if we used a cap of 100 or more, I think we'd still have a, a decent amount of lavas left from at least the Lunderhaus section. If I go back here quickly, I yeah. So, yeah, we'd be getting rid of a substantial number of flows, but we have from here onwards left. Oops. So there'd still be data left that we could do an analysis with. It's just curious. I'm just curious of the effect, the effect of data quality on all of these oh, yeah. things. Certainly. I, I think that's something we could certainly look at, um, is refine how we select the data, both for this and the dispersion analysis, and see what it, features remain or what features just fall, fall away. Yeah. It, I mean, I tried when, when we published the PSV10 data set, I tried to impose those stricter criteria, but of course then everybody, every, you know, you just have nothing. So um, it's always this balance, but um, Hannah and I found that it actually was quite um, significant, the effect. And she went back in the lab and measured a bunch more stuff yeah. in order pull us up to this new standard. And I'm just curious what um, what happens to all this stuff. Yeah, I, I would certainly be curious as well. And that's something we can do, especially when we get these extra lavas measured, we'll have even more data that we can see. Because the more data you have, the more you can really see what the effect will be, I think. Yeah. And so maybe somebody else could get a word in, Lisa. <laughs> Um, Anita has a question about uh, whether her fa failed directional data. Okay, yeah. Anita? Yeah, thanks. Great talk. Uh, lots of data. I was curious about your next, I think it's the next slide, where you show your kind of, oh no, when you have the max strat composite, uh, you put That's everything fine. together. Yes. So yeah. I was really curious if there was some correlation between your failed uh, data and the transition times between the the, um, the reversal. That was my first question. I don't think that we rejected any of the transitional flows. I don't think they're the ones that were rejected in my recollection. That's, it. That's Cyprus, by the way. Oh, very <laughs> <That's interesting. laughs> Uh, well, the other question will be, do you plan to do in polyintensity on, on those lava flows? Did you collect yeah. some? Yeah. Yeah, we, we have tried, but they altered like crazy. So traditional methods, I think, are going to fail, given the rock magnetic properties of many of these lavas. We will, we will 
do more comprehensive rock magnetic work and we will see if some of them look like candidates and we will maybe try and get some of them, some results but one thing that we will be trying is uh, to do relative paleo intensity analysis through this long section and hopefully that will allow us to compare with for example some of the sedimentary data um, that, are that are becoming available with these RPI and hopefully extend our understanding of field variations back further in time too. But of course, there, there are issues of using relative pay intensity with volcanic rocks, but it's certainly something of interest. It will be really interesting to correlate with the marine sedimentary course. Yes. Well, thanks. <laughs> yeah, especially as we can go back to 4.5 million years in this section. Yeah. I think right, that thanks. also be related to that question, I think there would maybe be something where you could take a preliminary look at the uh, average field strength in each of these crons and compare it with the dispersion because yes. um, it's probably true that we all believe that when the field strength is lower you'll get yeah. higher dispersion but um, yeah. uh, you could you could test that directly here. I mean it could be as maybe I'm not sure if this is what Richard was inferring it's the relative um, GAD versus NAD field. So maybe if both are slightly reduced, but the mm -hmm. GAD field is still stronger uh, than the um, non AD field, then maybe the dispersion, you get a reduced field, but the dispersion doesn't change in some way. Mm -hmm. maybe, maybe some things. But these are, I, I'm hoping these are things we can look at with these, these sections in the future. And especially as we, on Iceland, we have rocks going all the way back to 16 million years. So we can hopefully do this analysis on very long, well, not very long time scales, but you, you know, on longer time scales. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any last questions? No, not Heather, then. Thank you. Oh. Wait, Heather, just a suggestion that you go after the, the fresh flow tops. So things that are good for directions or yeah. often horrible for paleo intensity. But if you just go for the fresh tops. Oh, we, 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 would, love, we would love to, but uh, unfortunately there's no fresh flow tops in any of these lavas. Okay. Um, there are in the east much fresher lavas at higher, higher altitudes, and mm -hmm. I, they would probably be a good candidate. The east would be oh, wonderful to do. This Pardon? Is this is Skaftafell, so. Oh, yes. Yeah. But I'm talking about even further east, older than Escafiel. Yeah, but uh, you have the Brins Matian boundary somewhere up in those rocks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, it would be great to be able to get pay intensity. And it was one thing that Yamamoto san and I yeah. wanted, wanted to get. And we were, were thinking, yes, let's try and look at the tops of these flows or the clinkers or mm -hmm. and see if we can get anything out. But there really wasn't any hope of doing that in these sections at least.